Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on PEPFAR and strategic health diplomacy. Uh, today's webinar is based off of a BPC report published in July, and that report was a joint effort between the health and national security teams at BPC, and it was principally authored by former Senate Majority Leaders Tom Daschle and Bill Frist. If you are unable to attend the release event on July 9th, a recording is available on the BPC website, and we highly encourage you to go watch that. Uh, and a recording of today's presentation will also be posted on the BBC website sometime early next week. We're going to have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. We'll be using the chat box feature on your screen to collect questions. So if at any time during the presentation you think of a question, feel free to type it in at that time rather than waiting until the end. And please note that there is no option to ask questions out loud, so you will need to submit any questions you want answered through that chat box. For those of you who are not familiar with BBC, we are a nonprofit think tank based in Washington, D.C. Our topic areas include health, energy, national security, immigration, the economy, and more. Uh, I'm Hannah Martin, and I'm a senior policy analyst with BBC's Prevention Initiative. And joining me on the webinar today are Dr. Charles Holmes and Dr. Matthew Cavanaugh. And in addition to their great work at Georgetown University that you can see on your screen, <coughs> excuse me, they both serve uh, as consultants to BBC on this work. Today's webinar is going to provide a brief overview of strategic health diplomacy and BBC's past work in this area. We'll also give you a refresher on PEPFAR's evolution and health impacts and then do a deeper dive into our new analyses of strategic health diplomacy in the context of PEPFAR and provide some summative thoughts on how the U.S. can advance PEPFAR and strategic health diplomacy going forward. <clears throat> the theory of strategic health diplomacy, for those of you who aren't familiar, is that U.S. investments in health programs abroad have the potential to not only have extraordinary impacts on health, but to bolster the four pillars of national security, including protection of Americans, our home and our way of life, promotion of American prosperity, preservation of peace through strength, and advancement of the United States influence. BBC first published on this concept in 2015 when we released a white paper entitled The Case for Strategic Health Diplomacy, a study of PEPFAR. That 2015 report had three major findings. First, PEPFAR's ability to decrease mortality, morbidity, and the incidence of HIV AIDS limited the loss of human capacity, leading to better socioeconomic indices when compared to non-PEPFAR countries suffering from the HIV AIDS epidemic. Second, that PEPFAR contributed to a positive opinion of the United States in partner countries. And third, that through these mediating factors, PEPFAR played a role in security, stability, and governance. In addition to reevaluating the first report's findings, this new 2018 report also uh, examines the evolution of the program's strategies, reviews the public health impacts that PEPFAR has had, and considers how to best build on the success of PEPFAR and capitalize on the potential broader uses of strategic health diplomacy. Additionally, for the 2018 report, we conducted 15 interviews with current and former ambassadors in PEPFAR countries to better understand the diplomatic effects of the program. And we also include a new section that compares the Ebola response in PEPFAR and non-PEPFAR countries, all of which will be covered in today's webinar. <coughs> In our 2015 report, we identified six key lessons that should be used when designing strategic health diplomacy initiatives. These include having clear goals and identifying the policies needed to achieve them, addressing real needs with visible effects, being sensitive to local context, being committed to the effort long-term, building capacity, and being transparent and accountable. 
These attributes remain unchanged in our 2018 report, and we find that PEPFAR continues to meet all of these characteristics. And in some cases, such as transparency, we've even seen an increase in the program's focus on fulfilling these goals. This figure published in the 2018 report shows the pathway for attainment of key benefits of strategic health diplomacy, starting with health impacts in the outer ring and moving inward. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through this graphic from the outside in. As discussed on the previous slide, we identified six attributes of strategic health diplomacy, which are listed here in the light blue ring, just in from health impacts. And we posit that the health impacts of PEPFAR combined with these attributes leads to secondary effects, which are in the dark blue ring. And those include socioeconomic development, public opinion, governance, stability, and civil society empowerment, and diplomatic engagement. Then through the health impacts and these secondary impacts, we further posit that the United States has realized key benefits of strategic health diplomacy, which are listed in the center in red. And these are increased goodwill leading to collaboration on strategic objectives, strengthened economies for viable trading partners, and the mitigation of chaos, war, and disruption. The bulk of today's presentation will be spent examining the report's findings regarding these secondary effects and key benefits. And I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Charles Holmes. Thanks very much, Hannah, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'll speak uh, briefly about uh, PEPFAR's background and, and evolution and some of its health impacts. The um, Epidemic prior to PEPFAR um, began uh, back in the 1960s when people began dying of AIDS um, uh, on the African continent. And by the year 2000, over 25 million people were infected in sub-Saharan Africa. The epidemic tore into the fabric of societies and led to skyrocketing death rates among infants, children, and adults in their most productive years. At the turn of the century, some countries in the region had prevalence rates of 20% or more, and stigma and confusion about the disease often stymied efforts to educate and prevent further transmission. Initial efforts were put mostly into prevention because while antiretroviral medications had been developed and were being used in industrialized settings, they were prohibitively expensive for developing countries to purchase and distribute at that time prior to PEPFAR. And in the years leading up to 2003, when PEPFAR began, the epidemic posed a potential risk to world stability and uh, security. In the post-9-11 era in particular, the U.S. and the world began to focus on preventing fragile and failed states, and HIV and AIDS was contributing to that massive instability in many countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. PEPFAR, or the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, began in 2003 with $15 billion over five years proposed in funding for antiretroviral treatment, care for orphans and those affected by the disease, as well as uh, prevention of HIV transmission. While originally passed under a Republican administration uh, of George W. Bush, PEPFAR and both of its reauthorizations since have received strong bipartisan support. Additionally, the United States, along with the World Health Organization and the Group of Eight, is a founding member and the largest contributor to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, a public-private partnership founded in 2002 to leverage multilateral resources to fight these infectious epidemics. And PEPFAR is up for reauthorization this fall. With the PEPFAR Extension Act of 2018 introduced this August in the U.S. House of Representatives by a bipartisan group led by Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey and Barbara Lee of California. Over the past 15 years of the program, AR, uh, PEPFAR has treated over 14 million people with ARVs and has advanced uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, which has allowed over 2 million babies to be born without contracting the virus. There have been many other health-related achievements over those years. In addition, uh, throughout this report, uh, we compared countries that received medium or high levels of PEPFAR investment with similarly situated countries that received no or low 
uh, cumulative investments uh, over that period of time. And whereas in the 2015 report, uh, it compared PEPFAR focus versus non-focused countries, the expansion of countries receiving PEPFAR investments in the intervening years suggested that the level of cumulative investment uh, PEPFAR investment would be a better marker of PEPFAR's presence, and thus it was used throughout this report. In terms of health impacts, as you can see in the graph, we found that uh, the percent of total deaths attributed to HIV and AIDS in medium and high PEPFAR investment countries decreased by about 40 percent over that uh, period of time of 2004 to 2016. And, uh, Medium and high investment countries also had a greater percent decrease in all-cause mortality <clears throat> uh, than did low and no investment uh, PEPFAR countries. In addition to decreases in mortality, PEPFAR uh, has had an impact on disability-adjusted life years, known as DALIs, and the percent of DALIs attributed to HIV declined by about 33% in medium and high investment countries compared to about half that in no and low PEPFAR investment countries. <clears throat> and it's good to be clear, though, that uh, although these declines are substantial, mortality due to HIV and AIDS remains a major issue, and recent studies have suggested that we have further progress that needs to be made on this issue over the coming years largely related to the need to keep people on therapy over uh, their lifetimes. <clears throat> so PEPFAR has been a highly successful program, uh, which is now aiming for epidemic control, but it's had to contend with a myriad of challenges, including conflict, migration, and economic downturns. Furthermore, global AIDS, aid budgets and capacities are being tested as we know, by rapidly increasing numbers of infectious disease outbreaks, there's Ebola, Zika, emergence of HIV drug resistance. PEPFAR has evolved uh, constantly to stay ahead of this dynamic pandemic and uh, the global changes that are taking place in the environment. And it's now working towards the long-term goal of achieving epidemic control and ending AIDS as a public health threat. To achieve these goals, the program has embraced the power of detailed data that allows for efficient and effective targeting of program investments, accelerated the use of new treatment and prevention technologies, and developed a highly transparent and collaborative approach to its planning and implementation, resulting in greatly enhanced program performance, accountability, and efficiency, even in this environment of flat funding. An example of both a challenge to PEPFAR's mission and a testament to its ability to evolve uh, through the use of, of data and, um, has been the uh, challenge of the youth bulge. As you can see in this figure, much of the developing world is undergoing a major demographic shift, and by 2030, the youth population in Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to double in size since the start of the global HIV response, as you can see in the dotted line. This demographic trend is an impending tsunami that could reverse the last 15 years of progress fighting the epidemic because adolescents are at highest risk of acquiring HIV infection. It also impacts the stability and security of key U.S. trading partners. And in fact, uh, the CIA has in the past noted that the emergence of a youth bulge is often associated with the potential emergence of political instability. Adolescent girls and women are at particularly high risk for HIV infection compared to their male counterparts. The difference is primarily driven by sexual encounters with uh, somewhat older men and often involve financial or other resource exchanges. This figure here from Columbia University's uh, population-based HIV impact assessment in Zambia or Zamfia, uh, funded by PEPFAR and CDC, uh, found that HIV prevalence among 20 to 24 year olds is a startling four times higher among women than men. In order to address this growing gender disparity, PEPFAR program uh, has retargeted part of its funding towards the DREAMS program, a multi sectoral public private partnership aimed at uh, young women. In 2017, PEPFAR reported some initial results from that program, reporting that 65% of the highest HIV burdened communities or districts addressed by DREAMS achieved a 25 to 40% uh, or greater decline in HIV 
diagnoses among young women. So although there's a long way to go in terms of preventing new infections and achieving epidemic control, DREAMS uh, provides great evidence that the PEPFAR program continues to innovate effectively to meet emerging challenges. So with that, um, we'll shift the conversation to uh, uh, strategic health diplomacy in the context of PEPFAR. And as Hannah referenced earlier, the uh, secondary impact of strategic health diplomacy in the figure that she showed showed um, socioeconomic development, public opinion, governance, stability, and civil society empowerment, as well as diplomatic engagement as being the four key pillars of uh, strategic health diplomacy. And with that, I'll turn it to my colleague, Dr. Kavanaugh, uh, to take you through some uh, analyses uh, of those effects. Great, thank you, um, and thanks you all for joining. Um, so we did, in order to kind of look more deeply at this, this set of questions, we, we did a number of things. So to quantify the impact, we conducted a series of statistical analyses alongside the insights that, as was referenced earlier, came from a number of the interviews with ambassadors that we did in PEPFAR countries. What we're going to show you now is a series of slides based on, um, based on those same relationships uh, that were talked about previously between higher and lower investments in PEPFAR. Um, and while we don't show the results here, we also did a much more rigorous multivariate statistical analysis that shows that the relationships I'm about to show you hold, even, hold true even when we control for factors such as political stability, violence, other health aid, et cetera, so that we were really able to say that PEPFAR itself has had um, some very specific impacts far beyond just variation between countries. So the first slide we're going to show you here is focused on the economic development side. Um, and so strong economies obviously rely on healthy individuals, and the HIV epidemic um, has affected huge swaths of the most productive folks in society. Um, several studies have, have shown this very clearly, right, and that, that HIV itself had exacerbated pre-existing socioeconomic problems um, by eroding households and labor productivity, et cetera. Growth rates in highly impacted countries from studies um, showed they dropped between 2 and 4%. Um, one study in South Africa showed there was an estimated 38% relative decline in employment um, from individuals becoming ill from HIV. So that, that piece suggests that there was huge work to be done uh, by PEPFAR, and we show here that PEPFAR has actually been associated with um, faster uh, and more rapid improvements in, um, in economic indicators. On the left, you'll see GDP per capita, um, but even more evidence is the slide on the right, where you can see the greater changes in worker productivity in medium and high investment countries compared to those with low and no PEPFAR investment. That relationship holds even when we control for political stability, when we control for violence, when we control for other health aid. Um, what we show is that that, especially the, the kind of worker productivity piece, has been hugely impacted by PEPFAR itself. Um, and it's just worth noting, right, that that greater economic growth um, is not just, uh, not just beneficial to the country, right, writ large, but it's beneficial to the global economy as a whole and to the United States, right? Trade with Sub-Saharan Africa um, topped $40 billion in 2017. Uh, four of the five top trading partners in the region receive significant amounts of PEPFAR funding, and countries with PEP, direct PEPFAR investment, like Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, um, uh, South Africa, Tanzania, represent some of the fastest growing um, economies at various moments in the last, in the last decade. Um, so, so that's one, one piece that we want to share with you. The next really is to think a little bit about public opinion. So this slide is based on work that was done by Goldsmith, Horiuchi, and Wood um, at uh, ANU and Dartmouth. Um, and they had an article in the Quarterly Journal of Political Science a number of years ago that showed uh, PEPFAR investments were correlated with increased positive opinion of the United States. We updated this finding in this report, and we, hold, we find that it holds um, in 2017. There is a positive correlation between the amount of PEPFAR funding received and the positive opinion of the United States as measured by the Gallup poll. Um, this is the case for the period between 2006 and 2017, and it's true separately for each of the periods of U.S. presidential terms. So throughout the, the birth of PEPFAR, it's not just about um, a George Bush effect. It's not just about a Barack Obama effect. It's held throughout the entire, um, the entire time, and that's actually quite important. Um, we, we, um, we note here, right, that the relationship um, 
between PEPFAR funding and foreign opinion has a really important implications from everything from national security to working with allies, maintaining trade uh, relationships, responding to disease outbreaks, securing cooperation, all of these things um, are in fact directly related to public opinion and of course a key element of uh, U.S. diplomacy is about public opinion writ large. We also see, again, moving well beyond HIV, um, that governance and stability indicators also have been directly affected by, by support from PEPFAR. Um, so we know, of course, that stable, well-governed societies tend to provide the best opportunities for citizens, um, which of course contributes to global security and acts as a protection against radicalization and violence. This has been well shown in a variety of social science work. What we show here is that a review of World Bank indicators across countries with varying levels of PEPFAR funding, show that governance in countries with heavy PEPFAR investments saw, 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 saw sharpest gains. So if you look at each of these indicators, what we see is that um, the countries where PEPFAR invested heavily started off far worse off. And this is important for the overall study writ large because what it tells us is this is not a matter of, of simply PEPFAR picking some countries that were better governed or better off to start with, that in fact they were, they were worse off on all of these governance indicators. Um, we saw that they had fewer controls on corruption, less efficient government, more political instability, less capacity for regulation, weaker rule of law, and uh, less accountability or voice in, in, um, in, as measured by the World Bank. Uh, this is not surprising, right, because HIV has been related to, and linked to all of these things. And what we see is that after PEPFAR funding came in and consistently across, uh, across time, these partner countries saw steady gains in governance indicators, um, and this, this was statistically significant even if we control for the other elements in here, right? So if we control for government effectiveness, several of the other indicators continue to be statistically significant um, across time. And this matters a lot, right? Well, the message here is that PEPFAR has not only gains in HIV, not only gains in economy, but gains in governance overall, which is a key element of, of U.S. foreign policy goals. In addition, PEPFAR investments have been linked to more community stability, and this is a, a graph showing you uh, declines in, um, in uh, overall uh, in, in, uh, orphanhood, right? And this, combined with expansion of ARVs, is likely responsible for at least some of the public opinion mentioned in the previous slide. In 2017 alone, PEPFAR provided care and support to more than 6.4 million orphans, vulnerable children, and caregivers um, to mitigate the effects of HIV. Um, and what's notable here is that what we see is rapid declines with PEPFAR funding, including by 2010 when you see um, a drop below the zero mark there. And so that rapid decline has mattered a lot. And one of the core pieces, right, is that PEPFAR has prevented, helped prevent destabilizing effects of orphanhood by averting the deaths of parents, but also through the provision of programs to decrease orphanhood writ large. So we did interviews, as was mentioned, with a number of different uh, ambassadors uh, and former ambassadors uh, to PEPFAR countries who have been deeply engaged. It is the mission of, of these folks to advance strategic, uh, strategic U.S. interests, of course, across the, across the spectrum. And so we talked with them in depth about the ways in which they used PEPFAR, the ways in which PEPFAR had or did not have benefits. Um, and we came up with a number of different important, uh, important um, uh, realizations around how is it that the kind of impact of PEPFAR might be understood writ large. And so we kind of, I'm going to walk through a number of different ones. But the first one is, is not particularly surprising, right, that, that PEPFAR itself enhances public diplomacy. This is a core mission of any U.S. Um, US diplomat around the world, and it has been successful and useful to have a PEPFAR program as part of that, that strategic arsenal. Um, the improvements in public opinion that we showed um, have been directly linked to a lot of the, the serious improvement we've seen. And ambassadors talked about doing things like going out and speaking to youth, traveling with pop stars, doing all of those things in countries um, that, that change, US public, uh, change opinion about US, the US public and enable them to achieve their broader public diplomacy goals. Interestingly, a second and related concept that uh, ambassadors spoke about quite a bit was the idea that, uh, that PEPFAR opened doors in difficult relationships. One of the things that we know about the experience in PEPFAR countries is that these have not always been close allies, and these have not always been warm relationships between the United States government and several of these governments um, for a wide variety of reasons. 
one of the things that ambassadors spoke about uh, often was the ways in which PEPFAR provided an opening um, to engage on, on uh, HIV, which then opened the door to engage in a wide variety of other things that were completely unrelated to HIV. So here under number two, you've got a quote um, from one of the ambassadors just talking about the ways in which it opened uh, doors from everything from the Ministry of Gender to the Ministry of Justice to the Ministry of Education and Agriculture and Defense. The, the kind of broad swath of PEPFAR meant um, and has meant over time that actually uh, diplomats have been able to gain access, open doors, and have conversations across government than they reported that they would in other places, and that ambassadors who have served in multiple locations reported was possible in countries with PEPFAR programs in ways that it was not elsewhere. Three, the broad idea of expanding geographic reach of the U.S. Embassy. Um, you know, good, good diplomats find multiple ways and, and reasons to travel and, and to be out in the world. But one of the things that ambassadors spoke about quite a bit was the ways in which PEPFAR was uniquely positioned um, to enable them uh, to leave the embassy, leave the capital, to travel elsewhere. Um, the quote that you've got here, right, is, was a really interesting one of, of one of the ambassadors who was really talking about the ways in which when he arrived in the country, the relationship was not very good, especially the relationship with a key set of very old guard leaders. Um, and that one of the things that he was able to do was to just spend time out in uh, a variety of different locations uh, to go up and, as he says, you know, pitch up and find the local evening news there um, because there wasn't a whole lot else to cover, and that he would make regular evening news, and that was actually seen by the political leaders. And so the fact that he was going and actually supporting, being seen to support, and engaged with supporting the people from a variety of districts meant that the representatives of those districts and the representatives of those ethnic groups paid attention uh, to what he was doing, and that changed his ability to work in the country. Fourth, the creating deeper relationships with civil society and non-governmental sources of authority, right? This, this idea of being able to have a wide variety of relationships that you might not otherwise have. So here a quote from one of the ambassadors that talked about getting, uh, getting connections to traditional authorities and chiefs and faith-based leaders. These are folks who are gatekeepers um, to cultural information, to people, to perception. The fact that PEPFAR engages with this wide swath of, um, of uh, sectors of society that are touched by HIV and engages with them in different ways, through NGOs, engages with uh, activists, engages with all these different sectors, means that actually ambassadors regularly reported that they were able to build relationships in PEPFAR countries that they did not have elsewhere. Um, and that that was beneficial to their public diplomacy, but also to a variety of things like getting information about what was happening. One ambassador spoke, for example, about knowing um, about uh, a series of demonstrations that were going to happen in the country that were unrelated to HIV before they happened and before government even knew because of relationships that were, that were established. Fifth is interesting. Fifth, the point here is that, that PEPFAR itself has, a, has an independent effect on opening political space. One of the major goals of U.S. foreign policy has been building democracy, building openness. Um, but this as a goal of U.S. foreign policy is certainly not always welcomed by, uh, by governments um, and, in fact, is often uh, challenged and challenging to accomplish. Um, and uh, U.S. De democracy building programs have often struggled. One of the interesting things that we found through these interviews was the degree to which uh, PEPFAR itself was able to uh, have this opening of space because it was not simply about building democracy or building citizen engagement, but it was instead about primarily addressing HIV. But as we all know, addressing HIV requires doing a lot of that work. And so that actually, as a, as a knock-on benefit, was very substantial. It meant that, um, that uh, PEPFAR engagement was, had these broader effects that, as you see here, um, even in Vietnam, for example, where, uh, where the country had, was, was actually not interested in talking about law reform, not was interested in talking about engagement with the United States on a wide variety of things, all of a sudden through the PEPFAR program, when they started talking about uh, the treatment of drug users, which is, had been a hugely hot button topic in the country, the PEPFAR program opened space for that to happen. A number of ambassadors in other contexts talked about the degree to which they would travel, would find people, and invariably uh, the, the kind of folks who were most engaged in a variety of different uh, kind of what we would call democracy promotion activities um, had been PEPFAR recipients or been engaged in PEPFAR one way or the other. And so this, this positive knock-on benefit for democracy building is actually quite important. 
Number six touches just briefly on, on um, building military relationships. The fact that PEPFAR has a DOD, Department of Defense, uh, component has been hugely helpful and, and beneficial both for ensuring stability to ensure that people uh, in militaries are not actually dying of HIV, but also uh, that bridging uh, of military relationships on a topic that's not just about the movement of troops or uh, the financing of, of militaries has also been something that ambassadors reported was very important. And finally, ambassadors just recounted that PEPFAR enabled them to better negotiate increased domestic resources, right? Thinking about engagements with governments around how much are you spending, how much is everyone spending on HIV, um, that PEPFAR has successfully uh, opened doors for those conversations with the Ministry of Finance in ways that otherwise the U.S. government would told, be told largely was none of the business. Finally, I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about, um, about uh, another kind of broader knock-on benefit um, on the Ebola response. Um, so this is a graph that shows um, outbreaks over the last 15 years, and we need to add one more or two more in 2018 for, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, of course. But what's interesting is to, to just note, and, and this is not a, not a, I don't want to overclaim on this graph, but essentially what you see is that the red countries are countries that have had larger uh, PEPFAR investments, countries, you know, especially Uganda, um, where that really rapid, um, rap uh, that investment has happened. And what we've seen is that those, you know, that Uganda has been far more successful in containing Ebola than, than elsewhere. This is a variety of reasons, right? And this is not, not, not just a claim that this is just about PEPFAR. Um, but what was interesting is we asked, does, does, is there a causal relationship here somewhere? Do we see the fact that low PEPFAR investments in a number of places um, have, are also correlated to, to longer periods of time when Ebola is, uh, is uncontrolled? And that's what these are two are showing you. How long did it take for the country to notify the WHO? How long did it take for the um, epidemic to be gotten under control? And so what we did is a series of interviews um, and, and process tracing efforts to try to understand a bit about the ways in which, um, uh, in which the Ebola response and the, the PEPFAR response have, in fact, merged. There's been a lot of talk, I think, and, and attention, and appropriately so, to the ways in which, for example, polio programs or other programs have been associated. But what we found is that, especially in a couple of key PEPFAR countries, the PEPFAR investments have not only been beneficial, but they've been definitive. So that in Uganda, for example, in 2012, when there was an outbreak um, of, of Ebola, the first responders were from the Infectious Disease Institute, which was started through, uh, through significant support uh, from PEPFAR. And then actually IDI was the only program in Kabale district besides the government. The, the, as they then worked to quarantine the hospital and start contact tracing, do staff and transport, and, um, and to be able to um, buy protective equipment, PEPFAR funds were often the only source of funding to do that. The labs that were used were CDC labs. Um, similarly, in Nigeria, interestingly, um, you know, many folks will remember the, um, the moment when, uh, when a, a traveler collapsed in the Lagos airport, which turned out afterward to have been Ebola, touching off massive fears that it would spark a huge epidemic, since Lagos is, of course, a huge city, a crossroads of the continent. Um, and one of the things that we found as we went through is how many of the resources that were used to achieve control. Um, the, the Nigerian leadership and the Nigerian response was hugely effective and actually was able to control the epidemic so that we didn't see a huge outbreak in Nigeria. And that's in large part because of the field epidemiology training program that PEPFAR had funded and started. Um, it was run with HRSA PEPFAR funds. Graduates took leadership programs in almost all the aspects of the Nigerian response. They ran the contact tracing efforts that the labs that were used at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital were supported through a track one uh, Harvard-supported uh, funding through PEPFAR uh, to become a comprehensive HIV site. And that's what built the PCR capacity that was then developed to be able to enable them to address, uh, to address Ebola. And that, in fact, the time, at the time of setting up the Incident Management and Emergency Operations Center, FAST, in, uh, FAST was largely in Nigeria because of the presence of PEPFAR-funded PEPFAR staff meant that they didn't have to fly folks in. The existence of, re of existing resources that were repurposed was critical in responding uh, to Ebola. So this, this piece about thinking about the broader knock-on benefits of PEPFAR 
um, are really important. This is not to say, however, that PEPFAR alone is the only answer. And in fact, there's huge evidence to suggest that the beneficial opportunities for the United States government are combining global health security investments that are specifically focused on building those capacities for epidemiology, uh, epidemiologic response, along with the long-term capacity building from PEPFAR, have huge benefits, and that's actually what we saw in this study. I'll now turn it back to Charles for conclusions. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. So in terms of the, the way forward, uh, the United States has continued to take a leadership position in combating global health threats through PEPFAR, the Global Fund, the President's Malaria Initiative, and the Global Health Security Agenda. And much of that work is led by the belief that the U.S. Uh, has and should continue to play an important leadership role in global public health and that fighting these epidemics at their points of origin is smarter than waiting for them to grow and threaten U.S. shores. These initiatives collectively account for less than one quarter of 1% of the federal budget, an often misunderstood point. In year-over-year -year increases in the early years of the program, uh, PEPFARs, after year-over-year -year increases in the early years of the program, PEPFARs funding has remained relatively constant, as you can see here, since 2009 despite a growing mission that now includes epidemic control. So where do we go from here? <clears throat> we believe that first is to secure and expand the strategic health diplomacy impact of PEPFAR and build upon the foundation of goodwill, stability, and security that uh, has been built through the efforts of so many public health leaders and diplomats um, of the United States working closely with their counterparts. In addition, uh, in this first report, in, in its first report, the uh, Bipartisan Policy Center identified criteria for strategic health diplomacy, uh, those being the prevalence or rapidity of epidemic growth, the potential of treatment or prevention strategies, and the strategic value of the stricken areas. Um, as criteria for what would make a, um, an appropriate target for strategic health diplomacy investments. And using these criteria, uh, we've identified a few opportunities in addition to HIV and AIDS where the U.S. could potentially intervene and potentially gain strategic and national security benefits. These opportunities uh, include but are not limited to non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancers, and heart disease, hepatitis B and C, Ebola and other emerging pathogens, as uh, Dr. Kavanaugh referenced, and HPV, which can lead to cervical cancer and which has um, been made an important uh, prong of the PEPFAR program. <clears throat> so again, if PEPFAR and other existing U.S.-backed global health programs, um, such as PMI or President's Malaria Initiative, family planning, maternal child health, and newborn, and, uh, newborn health are performed with these principles of strategic health diplomacy in mind. The belief of the report is that the United States and our partner nations will reap much more uh, than they sow in societal benefits. So simply put, strategic health diplomacy, as illustrated by PEPFAR, leads to goodwill that encourages greater engagement with the United States around mutual strategic objectives, strengthened economies that support the growth of potential trading partners, better local governance and stability, and additional tools for diplomatic engagement. And even without these secondary effects, PEPFAR is an example of a program that's resulted in historic public health benefits from a relatively small investment of PEPFAR of taxpayer dollars. And the report strongly encourages policymakers to make a robust and sustainable investment in PEPFAR going forward and to look to strategic health diplomacy as an effective tool for advancing U.S. interests around the globe. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Charles and Matthew. Uh, we have had a few questions that have come in during the presentation. So if you have thought of any more, please go ahead and type them in, um, and we will jump into the ones that have already come in thus far. Um, so first, just a point of clarification. Uh, one listener asks, 
do these analyses demonstrate cause and effect between PEPFAR and these metrics, or are we just looking at correlations here? Um, and Matt, could you speak to that? Absolutely. So, so these are all correlational data. What we tried to do was to, to pull out the other explanatory variables, right? So things like does political stability actually explain these differences? Um, do other aid programs, does GDP explain the differences? Um, and what we found is that none of those do a good job of explaining it um, alone and that even controlling for those factors, what we find is that PEPFAR uh, is still statistically significant, that increased investment in PEPFAR is associated with increases um, or benefits that we described here. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all correlational data. We don't have, you know, any fancy uh, kind of other, other instrumental variables, et cetera. But what we do have, I think, is a very strong case that the other explanations that you might think would explain why it is that PEPFAR countries uh, do better overall on these indicators, um, they don't hold up and they don't, uh, the effect of, of PEPFAR uh, does not disappear. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is um, about what PEPFAR covers. So we talked heavily about um, medicines that it covers and also mentioned um, orphan support. Um, Charles, could you speak to some of the other things that are covered by PEPFAR funding? Uh, sure, thanks. Well, um, obviously a very uh, uh, broad and sort of comprehensive um, uh, set of services are, are, are covered through the PEPFAR program uh, aimed at reducing uh, HIV transmission both uh, from uh, mother to child but also to sexual partners as well as the treatment uh, side of things. Diagnostics play a key role uh, both in the initial uh, diagnosis of uh, HIV disease, which is usually done by rapid tests and um, there are <clears throat> increasing numbers of platforms that are helping us to more carefully monitor people on HIV treatment uh, with viral load, and our hope is over time um, some of those technologies are going to get even closer to, to patients as they um, become more point of care uh, amenable. So, you know, a whole range of, uh, of interventions uh, are being uh, delivered by PEPFAR. To, to gain these effects. We had uh, another listener who uh, I'm going to summarize a little bit, um, noted recent de-emphasis on and funding for strengthening health systems. And so this listener um, wanted to know how um, that de-emphasis of funding may or may not impact the long-term outlook for PEPFAR's success. So um, I can start off, and, and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kevin, I may have, have something further to, uh, to answer this with. I think, obviously, we can't speak for the PEPFAR program. Um, uh, I am aware that the, um, you know, the emphasis uh, in, in the program is, is certainly on controlling the epidemic, and I think there's an argument to be made that uh, with epidemic control, you ultimately lessen the burden on the health system. Uh, but obviously you need strong health systems and you need some of the components that were referenced in order to be able to obtain epidemic control. So um, I'm aware that the PEPFAR program has, um, in I think 2016, initiated the Sustainability Index and Dashboard, the SID, uh, which tracks a number of uh, the, the current state of kind of sustainability um, at the national level and, and, and at the systems level um, and helps to determine where there may be gaps in the delivery of services and in the, the health system itself. Um, so again, I can't uh, respond definitively on this um, and uh, would, would refer you to the program uh, itself. Well, and the other, I would just add, I mean, I think when we looked at, um, at the Ebola response, this was one of the core questions that we were kind of asking, right? What, what is it that got us, um, got us where we are? Was there any effect of PEPFAR on the Ebola response? Um, and what we found is that, like, very underreported um, but very clear, 
evidence that actually it was the, the strengthening of health systems through the PEPFAR program that resulted in a lot of these things. But it wasn't necessarily called health system strengthening. As we traced a number of the investments that actually made critical differences, um, rather than being called HHS program, HSS programs, right, or whether they're kind of called a training program or a capacity building program, et cetera, really the core elements were one, um, efforts to train up and create cadre of epidemiologic field workers. Um, and that has continued under PEPFAR and actually expanded. Two, um, efforts to build lab capacity. Um, and that, again, has also continued and strengthened under PEPFAR, right? A number of countries have seen uh, in recent years significant input uh, from PEPFAR um, to do, for example, uh, viral load testing, right? The expansion of viral load testing, that strengthening of those labs in order to do the HIV piece is the kind of things that we saw where it could be repurposed and added to by, um, in, in response to other diseases. And then three, the support directly to community health workers and other workers, right? The fact that most PEPFAR countries experience significant deficits in the staffing and the human resource capacity needed to respond to HIV is also true to respond to maternal mortality, is also true to respond to Ebola, is also true to respond to a variety of health pieces. And so again, those investments have largely been in the service of fighting HIV. Um, but that does not mean that they can't be repurposed and are not having wider, wider knock-on benefits. Uh, one really interesting example in Uganda right now where the, um, the kind of combination of the global health security investments and the, the PEPFAR investments mean that some of the surveillance efforts that were being used actually to around Ebola, et cetera, have been repurposed in the other direction and are actually now that the epidemiology surveillance efforts are being used to address, uh, you know, uh, are being used to address maternal mortality, but also being used to address um, HIV infection um, in mother to child transmission. And that kind of tracking of and capacity to identify hotspots where is transmission happening for HIV has also been repurposed to figure out where transmission is happening and a variety of other things. So I think my, my argument for that would be simply that, that PEPFAR's most important health system strengthening efforts have not necessarily been labeled so in the budget lines, but instead have been kind of the benefits of addressing the HIV pandemic. Thank you. Um, so right now we have one more question in the queue. So if you're thinking about asking it, um, go ahead and get that in the chat box soon. Um, so our last question um, is, do, uh, where do we see the use of telemedicine playing into that? Is that a way to increase productivity of PEPFAR or um, not so much at this time? So thanks. Um, I think that's a, that's a great question and, um, you know, again, would defer to the, the program um, for, for a response. But I think that, um, you know, having spent quite a bit of time in, in the field and seeing the emergence of, of new technologies, particularly communications technologies, uh, we think there's an enormous potential to um, expand the, really the patient-centeredness of care. Um, uh, not only within PEPFAR, but, but sort of more globally as we think about uh, addressing NCDs and, um, and other illnesses. At the current time, in, in many countries that are supported by PEPFAR, people have to travel long distances to pick up their medications and to be seen by a clinician and um, oftentimes uh, have long waiting times uh, when they arrive. We've um, the response, PEPFAR has really led uh, a strong movement towards more differentiated service delivery, which has to do with trying to sort of um, decrease the intensity of services when patients are mm -hmm. healthy and, and really don't need to be seen frequently. Um, and so to give them longer uh, prescriptions so that they don't have to travel as frequently or there are options for people to be seen in groups increasingly where people kind of self-monitor and have a supervisor at the clinic that they can check in with between uh, longer space visits. Um, I think telemedicine as the ability to transmit data cellularly um, increases in, in those settings has, uh, has great potential. Um, cell phone 
penetration is is um, as high as 60, 70 percent in in many countries, and therefore, um, you know, is allowing uh, increasing SMS and other uh, transmission of communication. And I think telemedicine would be a natural next step um, there as we try to make care easier for patients because at the current time without a cure, we've got um, individuals needing to be on treatment for their lifetime, and that's going to require us to make it as, um, as easy as possible for them to, uh, to, to do that, and we'll gain the greatest public health benefits um, if we're, we're able to do so. All right, it looks like we have one last question. Um, this participant says that we talked uh, a lot on the ability of PEPFAR um, and HELP to help advance U.S. interest in diplomacy, but this person is wondering um, if we found any of the reverse, that diplomats and diplomacy helped advance health outcomes, um, and is there potential to maybe improve that? Charles, Matthew, either of you? I can, I can start. Um, I mean, thanks, and I, I think that's exactly, that's exactly right. So we found um, over and over again examples in the PEPFAR program where the, the work of diplomacy itself um, transformed the HIV response. So core, core to that is one thing, which is political attention. So one of the things that we know writ large is that uh, from polling data throughout the continent, um, health and well-being often uh, figure low, both in public, uh, public opinion, but also on the, the, um, the level of attention that it gets from policymakers. In fact, the importance of the well-being, especially of poor folks, um, is fairly low on the, the list of priorities when you survey, uh, survey leaders of, in government in a number of these places. One of the core things that good diplomacy does is it, it does what a political scientist call agenda setting, right? It puts things on the political agenda that would not otherwise be. And in fact, over and over again, what we see in the history of PEPFAR over time is that diplomats were able to put HIV on the agenda, but not just HIV, elements of HIV. So that the leadership was able, for example, most recently, to engage in a really stark uh, bit of political diplomacy uh, that was incredibly important for people living with HIV, which is the transition to test and, and start. So you know, for, for a long time, the general consensus had been to delay initiation of antiretrovirals until people were you know, well immune compromised, were getting sick, were coming in late. Well, what did that do? In reality, what that was doing is it was, A, um, causing people to actually get far more sick than they ever needed to be, but B, resulting in lots of transmission, because we know now that HIV treatment is prevention. And so getting folks immediately onto antiretrovirals is key. Sending folks home to wait until they're sicker uh, turned out to have been a really bad choice. Well, across the world, this transition to say, actually, let's put everybody on treatment immediately um, was recommended by WHO eventually, right, was finally moving, but countries were very slow to want to move it, except PEPFAR countries, because diplomats in PEPFAR countries engaged immediately when the WHO guidelines came out with their counterparts, not only in the Ministry of Health, but also in the Ministry of Finance. And the conversation that happened was, was, a, was a diplomacy one. It was, how do we address this? How do we enroll way more people on treatment way faster? What will it cost? How can we get there? We need to have the policy shift. We need to have the financing to do it. Um, and that kind of effort actually was transformative. And the fact that it was a solidarity effort between the United States and governments made a huge difference. That's just one example. Um, and there's a variety from PEPFAR of the ways in which I think di diplomats themselves, and in fact, housing the PEPFAR program uh, in a diplomatic space, um, as the coordination mechanism and putting U.S. Uh, ambassadors in charge has been hugely beneficial uh, to the AIDS response. And I think there's clear lessons there. One of the things that we also found over and over when talking to ambassadors was the degree to which they're often not rewarded for that, that the, uh, the Afro Bureau, for example, uh, the Africa Bureau does not often reward folks for having a, uh, an impact on the epidemic. Um, or on another other global health thing. So maybe that's a shift that really needs to happen and an opportunity that's missed um, more broadly within the U.S. government. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I would just add to that, um, particularly on that last statement. Um, it seemed like one of the things we picked up from the ambassador interviews was, was indeed that um, oftentimes uh, U.S. ambassadors come up through uh, political or economic backgrounds and 
um, don't go into countries necessarily with um, as much of uh, a public health grounding that allows them um, to not only uh, effectively um, uh, combat the epidemic, which, which um, has ultimately been done, but, but to really uh, understand how best to uh, direct the program towards some of these um, potential benefits that, um, that we've, we've referenced. We, we obviously spoke to a number, uh, quite a number of people who were successful in those efforts, but um, greater sort of uh, health uh, literacy with, within the, the diplomatic corps could be a, um, uh, a really important and key next step. And I would say the, the converse is also true of the, the public health uh, response and, and doctors, nurses, and others who are carrying out public health programs, uh, I think would be well served to have even greater kind of awareness of some of the potential secondary benefits so that they can be um, even more intentional as they work in um, the countries of, uh, in which they're serving. So uh, lots of potential there. and. Um, uh, really um, pleased to be able to talk about some of these um, benefits of the program today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Charles and Matthew. Uh, here's the contact information. Um, if you have any outstanding questions that you didn't think of um, by the end of the webinar, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a recording of the presentation will be posted to the BBC website early next week. Um, and already on the website, as I mentioned, is the report and the July 9th uh, release event. Um, we'd also like to thank Gilead Sciences and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, for their support. And with that, I'll just thank you all for joining us. Have a great afternoon and a great weekend.